everybody's attention or ready to start? Can everybody hear me okay? Oh, I have an echo. It's echoing out the bottom of the TV. <laughs> I can hear myself twice. <laughs> I, I already hear myself at night because I've done this so many times and that's bad. <laughs> okay. All right, so here we go. By the way, the bathroom is behind that door if anybody was wondering where that is. Okay. So my name is Dawn Trammell, and um, I'm excited to be here with you. How many of you have been to one of my classes before? A, f a few. Okay, good. There's so many new people. That's great. It's fun to um, get to tell the same stories over and over, though. So I hope those of you who have been here before um, don't mind hearing them again. Um, people ask me, why do you do this? Well, I'm a teacher, and I enjoy people. I used to teach kids. Now I'm teaching adults. And... Um, when I first moved out here in the West, I wanted to garden, and I realized it was a little bit different than back east. And so I started trying different techniques and trying to figure out how to do this and doing research and things. And uh, for 10 years now, I've been gardening up here in the cold Northwest. And every year, I learn a little bit more and get a little bit better at it. And some of my friends started um, hearing about some of the things that I was doing, and they said, you need to start teaching people. And so that's what I've been doing for several years now. Um, I had read in a local paper that a lady wanted to, um, let me see, she had this experiment that she was going to do. She had a potted plant. She was going to put it out in her hoop house and see if she could grow it all winter long and, and going to experiment and see if she could do that. And I wanted to reach through that paper and tell her, yes, you can do this, but I didn't know how to reach her. And so I said, okay, well, Lord, how can I do this? Because I don't have internet at home. I, I can't communicate with people. And so um, when I got to town and got messages, I had two invitations. Don, come teach a class here and come teach a class there. And I said, okay, this is how this is going to go. And so that was three years ago. So since then, I've been teaching classes every Sunday or once or twice a week for three months straight. And then I stopped because I have my own garden to do. <laughs> so... And I do this also because I believe that we're heading into some tough times and that people need to be learning how to um, grow food. And so I believe that um, this information has God has shared with me, and I want to share it with other people. So that's why I don't charge, because I want people to be able to come and do this and share it with everybody they know. So here we go. We are starting, by the way, this is Gardening 101. Part 1 is an hour. Part 2 is winter gardening, and that's an hour. Part three is uh, putting together your own herbal kit, and that's about 30 minutes, and we are going to plow straight through, okay? <laughs> so hang with me. Try not to be overwhelmed. So number one, I always tell people to get ready. If you can, start in the fall, but if you're just starting, that's okay. First thing that you need to do is put up a very good fence because if you don't, you're going to be frustrated from day one because once those little critters or big critters learn where your food is, they will jump the fence, they will knock the fence down, they will do everything they can to get in there and get the food, because they know where it is now. But if you can start with a good fence, they don't know there's anything behind it, so that's half your battle, okay? Start with one. The next thing people need to know is preparing your soil. Um, I can recommend doing a soil testing kit from your local extension office. I'm not going to go in how to do that. That'd be a whole other three-hour seminar but you can buy those online, do your own soil testing. Um, you can use manures. I had a lady, if you're interested, a somewhat local lady, that she has horse manure. If you want to get a number, you can come up here and see that. Um, so talk to local neighbors, get manures from them if you want to go that route. If you don't, you could do uh, worm castings. You can bury your kitchen trash, compost in the garden. Um, all sorts of things like that will help to build up your uh, soil. When I first started, I literally just took my wheelbarrow out into the woods and just started digging under the trees and getting that thick, you know, dark colored soil that was under there. It's already composted leaves and things like that. So start with some good soil. And then for gardening, some people think it has to be really expensive in this huge, big process. It does not, okay? So this is what I'm going to teach you today is how to keep things as simple as you possibly can. So start collecting pots and things that you might already have. Like these right here are my favorite. This is a tofu tub, okay? This is a juice container cut in half. You know, mushrooms came out of this. So, you know, li little things, and if 
you go to thrift stores, sometimes you can find these. Um, you know, stuff like this, you buy muffins in or whatever. So just start collecting containers like that. Um, of course, seeds you'll need. We'll get into that in just a moment. And the next thing you really need is some really good potting mix. Don't get the cheap stuff. Trust me. I have tried to save a few bucks here and there, buy the cheaper mixes, and they don't do very well, okay? I'm not saying you have to buy miracle Grow, but I'm saying get something that has the micronutrients in it for your little seeds to get a really good start, because then you will have a, more, a healthier plant in the future. So spend some extra money and get good potting mix. All right, so now let's get into seeds. And by the way, thrift stores are excellent places to find rakes, shovels, hoes, you know, things like that. I give away all of my secrets, and then I'm wondering why I can't find anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I am not kidding, because I'm like, wait a minute. I used to come to the same thrift store, and I could find such and such and such and such, and I'm going, I don't see them. <laughs> but really, I want to help people, so I, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> okay. All right, so we are considered up in this area to be in a short season, okay? The definition of a short growing season is 110 days or less without frost. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, right? Okay, so I actually, I recommend 90 days or less, okay? All right. But you have to understand, I'm talking to people that come from all over, so I'm, this is the technical definition of a short season. All right, so there's two different types of crops that you can grow. Cool season hardy crops and cool season tender crops. Hardy meaning they don't have to have extra covers or anything like that. You can just put them in the ground, and that's like asparagus and beets, broccoli. There's a list there, okay? Tender crops mean they need more, they need a cover. They need to be either in a greenhouse or they're going to need um, some frost blanket protection or something like that, and there's a list of those there, okay? So those are the two type of crops or seeds that you're going to be looking for. Is this a zone five? Does anybody know? Three. This area here? Three, five. Three or four? Three. You guys are over here? Oh, wow. We have a three and a four and a five and a six. Okay, so I'm just going to try to teach to the middle. I'm going to say five. Okay. So go with that. Adjust as needed. All right. So when you know in the wintertime you get these beautiful seed catalogs, you're all excited because you're looking through there, and you're like, oh, I want to grow a watermelon like this, and I'm going to, no, forget it, okay, forget it. <laughs> grow stuff that you can grow here, okay? <laughs> I've been there, done that. So um, let's look at the two different types of seeds, the main two different types. It would be heirloom and non-heirloom, Okay. So there's a company that sells only heirloom. Baker Creek is one of them. There's other companies, okay? So heirloom seeds, it just means that you can save those seeds from that plant, and you should be able to get that same plant again next year. Unless there's some type of cross-pollination going on, which happens. Some of us know. You know, your zucchini crosses with whatever spaghetti squash, and then the next year you save that seed, and you get this really weird-looking, you don't know what. <laughs> So if you are going to purposely try to keep those seeds, you need to separate those plants out away from other plants so they're not cross-pollinating. Okay, so that's heirloom. Non-heirloom, obviously, is the opposite. You can still save the seeds from a non-heirloom plant, but you're not guaranteed what you're going to get. <laughs> I, don't, I honestly don't care. I'll save it, and I'll just eat if it grows, right? It's a, and that's something I can eat. I'm happy with that. Okay, and then hybrid seeds just means that they're crossing different types of seeds to get a certain type of plant. Like dogs, like a lab or a shepherdor, right? Crossing two different types. So some hybrid plants do better up in the north than, than even heirloom because they're crossing certain broccoli plants that are good for cold weather and that are resistant to certain types of diseases. So hybrid doesn't mean bad, don't plant me. That's not what it means, okay? So do your research on what type of seed would work best for you and where you are. All right, so when you're looking at the seed description on, on the package, it'll tell you what the plant is like. It'll tell you the days to germination. Germination means when the seed will pop up out of the dirt, okay? And keep in mind that if it's old seed, it will take longer. 
So this might say it, it should pop up in 10 days, but if this is 10-year-old seed, it may take 21 days. So keep that in mind. And you can germinate old seed. I've done it. 10, 11, 12-year-old seed. It just takes longer. Okay, days to maturity means that that's when you should be able to eat it after it's popped up. So if this says days to maturity, 50 days, that doesn't mean I put the seed in a pot and in 50 days I'm eating turnip. That means from the time it pops up, it should be 50 days, and then I'm eating it. So you need to keep that in mind, and that's why you'll see on my, um, one of my charts here, I start early. I've already got tomatoes that are like three or four inches tall and peppers that are three or four inches tall because I start everything from seed, and I start early. Okay, because some of my seed is old and I don't know if it's going to germinate. And then the next problem is you've got 100 tomato plants because you didn't know if they would germinate and you only wanted 20, right? Yes. <laughs> and then you're giving them away to all your friends. <laughs> okay, and then the next thing is that's important is how de um, deep do you plant the seeds? Because if you plant them, it'll tell you on here, if you, if you uh, sow your seeds too deep, they won't come up. Okay, and I had that problem here just a week ago. I'm, I've already got... Um, uh, what are they called? Peas. Um, snap peas going. And they're about four inches tall now. And um, I had planted some of them too deep that they weren't coming up. So I just moved the soil a little bit off the top and they popped right up. So that was pretty cool. There's one chair up front here, here too. <laughs> okay. So, and then it'll tell you how far apart to space everything. So that's, that's how you decipher a package of seeds. Now, this is um, just some dates that I have used for um, when to sow the seeds. And like I said, I start everything from seed. I don't buy plants. So you can take a picture of that. I don't know if it would help you or not. Um, oh, I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay. Um, celery, I always start early because it takes a really long time for it to germinate. Eggplant also, if you're going to be doing that. Tomatoes and peppers and celery, you should be doing that all right now. Now, let me, um, let me mention one thing. If you have this ultimate ideal setup where you're starting your own seeds and you've got heating mats underneath and you've got grow lights on the top, that is wonderful for you. And you don't need to start so early. Okay? I start early because I literally just put my pot of dirt in a sunny window. Because I don't run all that extra stuff. I don't have it. So adjust your dates, okay? Look at your package. Figure out how long it takes to come up and when you can transplant it outside. And then you do your own math. But this at least will give you an idea. So some pl plants that you can put out directly would be after, after frost would be your green beans, your beets, your carrots, and your corn. That's because those are your uh, more um, uh, cool, uh, what are they, tender your tender crops, okay? And then when you can work your soil, that means when you can get a shovel in there, you know the ice is gone, the <laughs> snow is gone, the ice is gone, and you're chiseling at it, trying to get... <laughs> you can go ahead and put things out like peas and potatoes. So usually that's in April, but, you know, don't quote me on that. We're in the north. And I also suggest that people start keeping good records because you'll forget. Write down when you sowed your lettuce seeds and when they came up and when you were actually eating them because next year that will help you you'll look at your calendar and you'll go oh yeah I remember I put that in the ground in March or whatever and I was eating it in July well next year I should start a little bit earlier because it took three weeks for it to pop up right so keep track of that all right so now what we're going to do is I'm going to show you and I used to do this live up here and had dirt everywhere but I realized nobody could see it so I uh, have this little feeble attempt at my cell phone here taking a video. So whatever pot you decide to use, make sure you put good drainage holes in it, okay, so that your seeds don't rot inside. Get your soil wet, first of all, in a bucket like this, okay? In fact, warm water helps it to germinate faster. So if you can get your dirt your soil wet first, it really helps because otherwise your seed is going to float around inside that pot and go everywhere where you don't want it to go. So you can see I'm kind of just smoothing it down, kind of patting it down a little bit in there. Don't make it like concrete brick, okay, but just gently put it in there. 
You can see this is a really fancy operation that I'm doing, right? Use your fingers, do a little hole, you know, just depending on the depth of whatever seed you're doing. And then just take your seeds, those are tomatoes that I did, and just put them in the holes there and then just gently cover them up with your fingers. Okay? Now, why do I grow everything from seed? Number one, it's cheaper. <laughs> Number two, you have control over what you're growing because if you go and you try to buy um, plants from, say, Home Depot or something, you don't know where those plants came from. You don't know if they're bred for this area or not. They may only grow in Florida, for all you know, okay? So it's, it's just, I think it's better this way, but you can do whatever works for you. And then you can see how I just gently watered it. And then label your seeds. You will forget what was in that pot. I promise you. I speak from experience on everything I'm telling you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, let's move these around. Let's take the stick out and put it in this pot. Yeah. Um, and you know what? Just tap it down gently, okay, and then water it gently. If you blast it with your sink, your seed's going to go everywhere inside. And then you're going to have, you know, down in the corner, all your tomatoes will be right here. I've done that too. Okay. So these are some common problems that people have had and questions that people have asked me, and this is just about starting seeds, okay? They don't germinate. They don't come up. Your soil may have been really, really cold. So if you just brought it in from your garage, not a good idea. Put it by your wood stove for a while or on a heater and add some hot water to it to warm it up. Um, and you might not be watering well enough. You know, when you touch it, you should have dirt sticking to your finger when you, when you pick your finger up, okay? Keep it moist. And check the depth of your seed, too. If it didn't pop up, it, again, it may be, it have been too deep. And if your seed is really old, and you'll know because there's a date. Each package has a date on it, okay? Um, it'll still come up. I've, I've, I've always had seed come up, except maybe once. Um, what you can do to remedy that situation is put your, put your, um, your little tray of seeds on top of your refrigerator. That's about the perfect amount of heat. Okay, if you have heating mats, that's great. Use that. Put it over top of a heating vent in your house. That'll help it get it going. But remember, it'll dry it out also. Very quickly, it'll be dried out. Okay, if you have a wood stove, put it on, you know, a shelf above your wood stove. That helps. In, and I did that with the 11-year-old um, eggplant, and it popped up just like that. So that's all it needed was that little bit of extra heat. This is another solution that works really well. So that's my warm, sunny window, okay? Literally, you can just make your own little greenhouses. See how perfect? And that helps keep them a little bit warmer at night, um, but you also need to make sure that you are propping it during the day because they can get uh, moldy very quickly and they need the airflow, okay? So that's another idea. So what if once they pop up, then they stop growing? Sometimes that happens. Um, number one reason would be the soil is not good. Cheap growing mix. Also, it could be just um, contaminated. It could have, um, what do you call it, not bugs, but different things in there that microbes and things that have grown in there during the year and you didn't clean the pots well enough or something like that. And maybe you're just watering it too much. Some other problems could be aphids or gnats. Has anybody ever seen gnats coming out of your soil? Yeah, so you can, you can sanitize your soil. You can look online. I, I can't get into all that, but there's ways you can do that in your oven. You can sanitize your soil. You can also put like a clear plastic over your garden beds if you need to sanitize. Let the sun um, heat it up underneath. That'll kill things in the soil. Um, <coughs> the other thing is make sure that you are washing with soap and water your old pots that you use. Don't just throw them in the shed and expect everything to be okay next year when you get them out. And it's easier to do that in the spring when you're done with the pots than in the fall when it's cold. Trust me. <laughs> All right. And then another problem, I'm going to skip down to the bottom. Another problem is the damping off, which is suddenly, you know, they pop up and then all of a sudden they just die. Maybe you watered it too much. More needs more air circulation. And again, same thing with the soil and bugs. Now let's talk about the legginess. Legginess mostly happens with tomatoes. 
and I'm going to show you what it looks like. Okay. Has anybody had a tomato plant that comes up and looks like that and seeds? Okay, so I'm going to show you how to avoid this problem. Um, people always ask me, why can't you just take a pot this size and put a seed in it? You can, but you'll get that. Okay, I used to work at a greenhouse for a few years, and what we did was in the little uh, plug trays of plants, seedlings would come in, and we would plant them in a bigger pot, and then a bigger pot, and then a bigger pot. And I'm going to show you how to do that to avoid this legginess problem. Um, but one reason they look like that is because there's a lack of sunlight, because I'm just growing them in a window, not under grow light, so that's part of it. They're reaching for the light, okay? They need to be rotated, and they need to be transplanted, so I will show you that. But one thing that you can do to help if they start falling over, just tie them up to a little stick, like a little bamboo stick or a branch or something, tree branch, that'll help keep them up until you can transplant them. Okay, so why do we want to transplant? Transplanting makes for a healthier plant. Um, because what happens is, you've got your, um, your little seedlings in here. They can't go very far. Their roots can't go very far, because it's not very deep. It's shallow, okay? And so what you need to do then is you dig them up, and I'm going to show you a video. But you dig them up out of here. And then you would put them in the next size up, which I don't have it with me, but you'd put it in the next pot up. And then from there, you'd put it in the next size up. And the reason you do that is because when the roots are in a smaller pot, they can't go very far, which is forcing the growth up into the stem, which makes for a thicker, um, healthier stem. Does that make sense? That's why you don't want to just stick a seed in here. Unless it's maybe like a sunflower. You might be able to do that. So the three main plants that you're going to be transplanting are tomato, pepper, and eggplant. And that's because you're starting them so early. Okay? So by the time you actually are going to put your plants outside in the garden or in the greenhouse, they need to be about like this big with flowers on them probably. Okay? And by doing this method, you should be eating at least cherry tomatoes in June. So you should have tomatoes in June, July, August, September, and into October if you add protection. And this works because I've been doing this, okay? So let me show you what it looks like. So these are the little tomatoes that you saw me um, sow earlier. Do you see the little leaves in the center of that plant? Those are called the true leaves or the second set of leaves. Do not transplant anything until they have those second set of leaves on them, on them in the, inside the plant there. It will die. It will not do very well. It will struggle and struggle and struggle. I guess it just helps it. I don't know why, but that's just how it is. Now, this one I'm going to show you. This is a leggy one. It's really tall, kind of skinny. So I'm going to show you how to remedy this problem. You're literally going to take that little tiny seedling, and you're going to fold it or bend it like a U, and you're going to put it down inside the hole. Did you see that? OK, so I'm going to show you again. I'm a teacher, remember? <laughs> I have props. So this is your leggy tomato plant, right? OK, so you dig the whole entire tomato plant out, and you bend it like this gently. Don't crack it, OK? Bend it gently, and then just put it down inside the pot. And it will grow roots all along that whole entire stem. So you want to bury it all the way up to those top green leaves. Put it down as deep as you possibly can. And you're going to have a much healthier plant that way. Does that make sense? So you're going to do this when it looks like, let me go back here. Yeah. See the second light leaves in there? When you see those second set of leaves, you literally just take a fork, dig them out, and put them into the next size up, which for me was those black pony, pony packs, they're called. The four packs. This is the net another size up if you want to use these cups or this one. When do you know when to transplant? How do you know? They just start getting taller and they look like they're about to start falling over, right? Okay, another way you can tell is you can just take the plant out and look at the bottom of it and if it's root bound, you know what root bound means in there? You got to put it in something bigger. And if your whole plant like that is all root bound in there, just take your finger and just break up those roots, okay? And then put them into the next size up. So here would be the last transplant. 
okay, into these big, like this. Does it take time? Yes. Does it take energy? Yes. <laughs> All this stuff. But you, if you don't do this, you won't have good results. You can stick a tomato seed in the ground if you want to in June after danger of frost, but you're not going to get anything to eat. I mean, you may have a little green one about that big by the time August comes. So by doing this method, you will be eating tomatoes, red ones, okay? So now, you've got all these pots sitting in your sunny window, right? So now what you have to do is you have to do what's called hardening off. That means you're getting them ready to go outside where it's cold, colder. You can't just take a plant that's been sitting in your beautiful, warm, sunny house and throw it outside. It'll die of shock. Okay, so you have to get it used to being out in the sun, in the wind, the, the dogs brushing on it, whatever it is. So what you do is you start out about two, three hours a day, and you put your plants out in a, a filtered sunlight area. Do not just blast them with sunlight all in one day. Okay, that's, that, that's not good for them either. So on a sheltered porch, under a tree, and then move them in. The next day, take them out, move them out again for two or three hours, add a little bit more time, um, and just do that for a couple of weeks until they start getting used to it. Now, you'll probably still see some of your leaves curl a little bit. No, they don't like it. Well, maybe move them into the shade a little bit more. Maybe that day's a little bit cold, but just keep doing that back and forth until they're used to being outside. Now, if you already have a greenhouse or a hoop house, you can do like the picture on the right, and you can harden your plants off up there. So that's what I do. I just put everything up there around April because I'm tired of them being in my sunny window. <laughs> that's a lot of plants to be in one sunny window. So I put them all up there, and then I cover them with the frost row cover, and I leave them up there um, completely covered for at least a week. And then the next week, I'll peel it back, you know, and expose them to a little bit more sun, and that's how I do it up there. And then eventually, they'll go into the ground. So while you're hardening off your plants, you should be getting everything ready for your plants to go into the ground. So if you're going into the hoop house, get your d holes already dug and put something down in the bottom of the hole, like compost. That's worm castings right there, that real black gold, they call it. Um, yeah, get everything ready. Um, another way that you can kind of speed up the process a little bit is you can put black plastic down or black landscaping fabric down over top of the soil or the dirt wherever you're going to plant. And that will thaw out everything underneath a little bit faster. That'll help heat it up. You can buy th soil thermometers if you want to do that too, um, and actually measure the temperature of the soil. Um, and anyway, so you're doing all of that and getting your plants ready to go in. And then if you're going to put them outside, just be aware that they will probably go into more shock than they would if they were in the greenhouse. But what you need to do if you're transplanting outside is to do it after 4 o'clock because some, somebody told me this, and I should have written it down, but there's a scientific process that happens to the plants after 4 p.m. that something inside of them shuts down. So there's not as much shock going on when you're transplanting them. And then make sure that you're watering them right away. Okay, If you can do it on a rainy day, that's even better for the plants. It's a lot easier on them. And, and then if you're going to add support, like you see the sticks there, if you're going to be adding support, do it at that time. As soon as you put the plant in the ground, put the support with it, like tomato steaks. Don't go out, you know, in three weeks and be pounding in a tomato steak. You'll bust up all the roots that are, that are down in there, okay? So these are some different ideas for support. These are just strings that are um, strung up to the beams. In the hoop house, um, the bird netting works well for um, peas, and then a lot of people like to use the uh, cattle panels. And so you can tie your plants up to those. So th those are some ideas for different supports. Intensive planting is where you're just taking a whole bunch of seeds and you're putting them all in one little area to transplant later. So let's just say you just have a little small space left in your garden or in your hoop house you don't know what to do with. Well, grab an entire package of lettuce or, or bok choy. I think that's what that is. I don't remember. And just do a few rows of that really, really close together. And then by the time the rest of your garden starts getting bigger, you'll know where these can go. 
So what you do is you just take your shovel in there and you just dig up that whole, you know, 100 plants or whatever, and you just start putting them wherever you want them. You transplant them around. So you can put your lettuce under your broccoli, put some over here under the cauliflower, and that way you can spread it around that way. So that's just another idea for you. So if you are going to transplant some plants, I'll show you how to do that. I've, I move things around in the garden a lot. I don't move like cauliflower or cabbage, but I'll move lettuce and spinach and the celery and things like that. So this is a Chinese pink celery. And literally, you just take your shovel in there and you just break up the roots all the way around it. Just cut a, you know, a trench around it, dig it up, and then go put it where it is you want it. <laughs> you will have some, um, some death of some of the leaves on the outer side. In fact, if you're going to do this with lettuce, I recommend that you go ahead and harvest a lot of the lettuce off the plant first because it will go into shock and then it'll go and you'll think I killed the whole plant. But it will come back, okay? It will come back. So with celery, by the way, dig up your celery before it gets frosted in the fall and move it into your hoop house. Okay, you cover it up. I'll show you this in part two. You cover it up, same as all the other plants, and then you'll have celery. And then you can move your celery back out again in the spring. You can use that same celery plant two, three years. Yeah, pretty cool. Okay, I get questions on weed control. This is just an idea. Cardboard works really well. Mulch also. Um, if you're hand watering, that helps. Don't have as many weeds that way. If you have a drip system, that's even better. So just some ideas on weeds. It takes time. <laughs> and then pollination. Um, has anybody noticed there's a lot less little pollinators around, it seems like? Yeah, so it, it helps to know different ways that you can pollinate plants. Um, tomatoes are really simple. Just walk through your greenhouse and just kind of shake them a little bit. They sh shakes down the pollen and pollinates the flowers. Um, eggplant pollinates itself. So that's kind of nice to know. You can uh, put that in the corner of your greenhouse and cover it and leave it there. Cucumbers, there's three different kinds. So if you're looking at one to put into a greenhouse, make sure you're getting the ones called parthenocarpic. And Johnny sells them. Parthenocarpic, they do not have to be pollinated. And they've been working well for me, so I think that's kind of neat. Uh, cucumber. Yep, cucumber. Parthenocarpic. Yeah, it's a weird name. <laughs> oh, I see. Is there any way that you can, Shane, is there any way that you can put, I see. Gotcha. Yeah, see, there's an overflow. There's more people in that other building. So they're trying to, yeah, get everybody happy. All right, and then with melons, um, I'm, I don't do melons anymore, by the way. I've given up on trying to do that. Um, summer and winter squash, you can hand pollinate. So that is a picture right there of the female flower. So the female flower has the fruit attached to it. That's how you know. People ask me the difference. Okay, so I took a picture of that. I think it's zucchini. But anyway, when it opens up, the, the little flowers look like a bowl, okay, on top of the fruit. So then what you do is you just take one of the other or not attached to a fruit, that's the male flower, and you just stick the, female, the male flower on the female flower and leave it there. Okay? You can just leave it there. So you're talking about the one that's open. <laughs> the one right in the center that has the... I, I don't want to go into too many more details because it's embarrassing to me and people laugh and... There's a male flower and a female flower. You can look it up on YouTube and watch people actually do it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, how do we extend our incredibly short growing season? Move south. <laughs> Move south, she says. Yeah, but then you wouldn't live up here where it's beautiful. Okay, so here's one idea, and I did this and it worked really well. I dug up my pepper plants before they got frosted in the greenhouse, brought them inside, and they all ripened. They turned red and orange, and they lasted until December, and then they got aphids, and then I threw them out. But it's an idea. If they're not quite ripe yet, you can do this. This is another idea for people who may not have a garden space. Maybe all you have is a front porch or a back porch. 
I found this online. Literally just get a bag of potty mix, cut the top out, and put seeds in it. There's your garden right there. And cover it up with a plastic thing, and there you've got a greenhouse just right on your back porch. The lady who did this, you should have seen the greens that she was growing there. It was incredible. So here's another idea. So your soil is workable, maybe around what, May? <laughs> I know it's different for everybody. Okay, so let's say May. So you've got your broccoli in there, but you know there's still going to be some frosts coming, okay? So just stick a little thing like this over top of it, and there's your greenhouse. You just protected that plant for the next, like, four weeks, okay, from frost. This is another idea I found. Um, these work really well. That's what they're called, a wall of water. You can buy them online. You fill them up two-thirds of the way with water, and then you stick them over top of the hole of wherever your plant is going to go. So let's say you're going to put your plant out in June. Then you'd put your wall of water out in May, like a month before, so that it's warming up that soil and it's creating its own little microclimate and its own little greenhouse inside there. It's really cool. And then you can put your plant in, inside. You can do it earlier if you want. I have. I've experimented with it early because it's not going to frost inside there. It is amazing. It and then you're... <coughs> it's not going to. It heats up during the day and it heats up that water. So it's like a water blanket all the way around, heating blanket around that plant. Um, and then your plant just grows out of the top, and then I get rid of it when it starts getting that big. But that's just to protect from frost. This, these are just ideas to extend your season, okay? Yeah, yeah, for many, many years. This is another idea. You can get some bales of straw and put a uh, window over top of it and grow under those. But just be aware if you're growing under glass, it gets hot very, very fast. So make sure you're ventilating. Oh, children, yeah, you don't want little ones walking on top of the glass. That would be bad. Okay, so this right here would be my favorite way of extending the season. This is the easiest way. Um, what you do is you get yourself some of this PEX tubing right here. It comes in big rolls, okay, and you cut it to the width of whatever your bed is. So what you do is around, I don't know, April, maybe mid to late April, Go out in the garden and put down your black plastic or landscaping fabric. And let me give you another hint. I didn't give you all my hints. Um, go to places like Home Depot and get their free lumber wrap. It doesn't cost anything, okay? And because black landscaping fabric is very expensive. So anyway, get the black lumber wrap. Cut it to size to your beds. Lay it down and let the sun heat up those beds. It'll melt the everything underneath. Heat it up, okay? After you've done that for uh, two, three weeks or whatever, then you can use this method. Then you're going to stick these into the ground inside the beds, okay? Then you're going to put in your little cabbage plant. Remember, these are the hardy crops. Th so this would be like your cabbage, um, broccoli. Asparagus is already out, but um, what else? Cauliflower. Yeah, cauliflower. Thank you. Pex, P-E-X. Pex tubing. Yeah, cold hardy, cold hardy things like, yeah, um, even lettuce and spinach. So once your soil is thawed out and heated up with that black plastic, go ahead and transplant your things that you've already started in your sunny window, remember? Okay, transplant those out maybe beginning of May. Put these in the ground and then cover them up with your frost blanket. Okay? You can see the picture there. Cover it up. And this is, I'll go over this again, but it's just, it's basically called a frost blanket. Part two, I'll get in more to that. So cover or uh, clip it with clothespins or something like that to keep it closed. Now you've just added 30 days to the beginning of your season. Because now you've got the whole month of May because everything is covered. Okay? So now instead of 90, you're up to 120. Isn't that good news? <laughs> So now, at the end of the season, do the same thing, okay? At the end of August, whenever your first frost date is, usually first week in September or so, okay, before that first frost comes, put these things back out again, cover everything up again, and you'll get another 30 days out of your plants. 
You can still be growing broccoli under there. You can still be growing cabbages and cauliflower and lettuce and kale and chard on just from these. And maybe even tomatoes. What was it? If it's heating up, yeah. If it's heating up during the day, open it during the day and vent it and then cover it up. Yeah. Yes, another good way of pollinating plants is running a fan in the greenhouse. That's right. Um, this was just built by my nine-year-old at the time. And so if he can do it, anybody can do it. That's just gray conduit pipes stuck into the ground. And the front is a pallet cut in half. Okay? And I tell you what, I had so many cucumbers growing in that. I've never grown so many cucumbers again since that. So it can be done. It's just another way to extend your season. All right, so let's go through some other things that I think you need to be growing. This was at the beginning, so I'm not going to spend time on this. These are your herbs and why to grow herbs, properties for herbs. Okay, I will play this again at the end so you can get pictures of it again. Um, asparagus comes back every year, 20 years or more. So put in a bed of asparagus if you don't already have one. Um, and from what I've understood, asparagus is one of the first plants that comes up in the spring and one of the most nutritious. And the reason being is, I believe, is because you haven't had anything fresh to eat all winter long. So this is the first thing that pops up for you. Um, so make sure you're doing that. You can do it from seed. I've done that. Or you can buy the crowns. It's a little bit faster. First year they come up, don't harvest any. Cannot eat any. That's hard. <laughs> Second year, you can harvest about maybe two or three pieces of asparagus, and that's it. So see, these things take time. Third year, you can eat as much as you want. Cabbage, grow cabbage, okay? It does really well up here. It likes the cold. Um, just make sure, I'm giving you another hint here, keep it covered from the day you put it in the ground. And again, I start them by seed. I start them in one of these, or I'll just start them right in the greenhouse if I have room, and then I transplant them out, okay? And then I cover them immediately with one of these. And I cover it from head to toe, and then I cover it with dirt and seal every nook and cranny and crevice <laughs> because the cabbage moths will find their way in. They always, I don't know how those things do, but they always do. And then once they do, you have to uncover it every day and pick off the little worms, okay? So cover it right away. This is a frost blanket. So you can do two different types of cabbage. You can do one that's more of a shorter day that you can harvest in the summer and eat. They won't get as big. Um, and then you can do a long-term storage cabbage. It's actually called storage cabbage. And that's what I grow because you can actually keep it all winter. I'm still eating cabbage. Okay, cabbage, and by the way, pull your cabbage plants up in the fall and hang them by the roots, and they will last you all winter long in a cold storage. Okay, so you've got now fresh cabbage, coleslaw, sauerkraut. Just make sure that you're buying the right seeds. They're stored. They're actual storage ones, so you're not going to harvest these in July. You don't harvest these until, like, September, Are October. You them in the, like, underground nope, yeah. just a cold storage room. Like if you have a cold garage or an unheated basement, you know, or a root cellar, anything like that. Yep, hang them upside down. Okay, so for carrots, I used to try to grow carrots out in the garden and then dig them all up and try to store them all winter, and they always rotted every single time. I don't know what I was doing wrong. So I just leave them in the greenhouse now, and then I just go out and pull them when I need them. Some people say I leave them in the ground in the, in the garden, and pull, and I don't know how you could do that if you have snow. If you have eight feet of snow, I'm trying to figure out how you're, I mean, you could, you could, but you'd be shoveling it every day to make sure that your patch of carrots was always available. So it can be done. It can be done. I'm just sharing what I've done that works well if you have a hoop house. And carrots and tomatoes are companion plants, so grow them together. So do a row of tomatoes, row of, of carrots, tomatoes, carrots, okay, like that. And then you'll have carrots all year, okay? Um, 
I will start the first one in April, and then I'll do every couple weeks, I'll do another row. So they're not all ready at the exact same time. That would not be good. Um, and by the way, I forgot to mention, when you put your tomato plants in the ground, put a radish seed with the plant. The radish seed will grow. Let it grow and let it flower and go to seed. And the, be the bugs and the pests will eat the radish instead of your plant. And another, tomatoes. Radish seeds with your tomato. As soon as you put it in the ground, just put a seed in there. Um, and uh, what is it? Garlic, too. Put a little bulb of garlic in between each of your tomato plants, or just put a whole row of garlic between, however you want to do it. That's what you're looking at there in the center there. Picture on the right. No, you're, anyway, the tall, green, skinny things. That'd be on your left, I think. That's garlic. Just leave it in there. You can clip the tops off and eat them if you want to when they shoot up those little things. That helps with pests. Nope. The bugs don't like the garlic. Okay, so if you're not growing garlic, make sure you're growing it. Very medicinal, very medicinal. Put it in in October in your garden before the ground freezes. Cover it up with thick mulch or straw. That keeps it insulated so that it doesn't start growing right away. You don't want it growing until spring. And it does its most growing in the fall. So you want to water, 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 water in the fall as soon as you put it in the ground. And how do you know when to harvest it? The bottom two leaves start dying, okay? They turn brown. You can see a picture there, the bottom picture. Then pull them out, put them in the sun, and dry them. And then you can braid them together. Or just I just clip them off and put them in an old bag of some kind with air, good airflow. And then you should have garlic all year too, okay? Green beans grow really well in the north. A provider is a good name if you, if you are looking for one called provider. Um, people have told me you can't start them early and transplant them. Well, I've been doing it for years. It works for me. Um, that is called a flat. You can buy them online or at greenhouse nurseries. You can get them used there. So I take a flat, fill it with dirt, and put a green bean seed in each one of those and put them in the greenhouse and just water them until they come up. And then I transplant them out after the danger of frost in June when they're about six inches tall. Now, the, um, the major bonus of doing it this way is that when you walk out into your garden and you see your row of green beans, you actually have an entire row of green beans. Because how many of us have taken seeds and put seed, 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 and one comes up over here and one comes up over here, right? And if you have a little space, that's frustrating because you, you don't have time to start over. So by doing this, you know where all the plants are. You have a plant every spot you want it. Now grow extra ones. If you think, uh, do the math and figure out how many you need for your row. But if you think you need 60 plants, plant 90 seeds. Because they're not all going to come up. And they're not all going to survive. So these ones that are left in the, in the uh, flat here are the extra ones. So what I do is if one doesn't make it for some reason, I just take one of those and stick it in where the old one was. Bush, and there's two different types. There's bush and pole beans. Bush are short pole or tall. If you're going to do the tall ones, you better have a big tall fence or big tall teepees or something to grow them on. Was that what you were going to ask about? The no, I was going to tell you about the Italian green beans. I just told them about. Oh, she says the Italian green beans go nuts. <laughs> so if anybody wants to look those up, okay. Okay, so for onions, has anybody noticed the price of onions? <laughs> So, and by the way, if you want to grow onions, you need to grow long day onions. There's three different types. Short day, intermediate day, and long day. Long day. We have very long days in the summer. Okay? So, um, one good one would be the yellow Spanish onions. I've had good success with those. There's two, well, there's several different ways I guess you can do this, but... Has anybody ever bought the little um, <laughs> onion sets that come in a bag? What have they done for you? So I've been doing that for years, and I've, I was trying to figure out why don't they grow? They don't get, I mean, what a waste of time and money. They're two-year-old seed. I did research on it. They are selling you two-year-old seed. It's like a trick. It's a bad trick. So you need to either buy the, the onion plants, which you can buy them. I've seen them at North 40. They don't have them very long once they have them in. 
or you need to grow your own from seed. Those are your two options, okay? So you can um, grow from seed if you start early, like right now, okay? Start them in a little tray like this. Don't worry about spacing because they separate very easily. Once they pop up and they split like this, you can then you can transplant them if you need to. You could probably put about 50 or 100 of them in this, spread them out a little bit more so they start getting a little bit bigger until they can go outside. Um, so that's one way of doing it. What I'm doing now is I'm actually overwintering my onions. And so what I do is I go out in August and I plant very close together intensive planting onions, okay, in a little space that I have. So they get to be about six inches tall. Before the frost kills them, I take them all and I move them all into the greenhouse. And then I cover them with a frost blanket and then they're there all winter long. And they do great, I'll show you here, they do great. And then in the spring, when it's okay to put them outside, then I just move them all out and put them in a bed and space them out. So that's overwintering if you wanted to try to do that. Um, and then the next trick to get them big to bigger bulbs is you actually ring, it's called ringing them in. If you want to look it up on YouTube, there's people that do um, demos of that. Ring them in, like a ring. Um, you can take an old butter knife and bend it in half, and that gives you like the perfect shape of a tool, a gardening tool. And you take that, and you take the dirt, and you pull it away from the bulb. And then you can add fertilizer, which would be blood, no, bone meal. Bone meal. Blood meal is the nitrogen that gets the green part going, but then you need the other, which is the bone meal, and that makes the bulb swell. By pulling the soil away and by adding a little bit of that fertilizer, you should get a bigger onion. Okay, so let me show you. This is the, um, yeah, this is in, well, I planted them in August. This is probably September or something before they got frosted out. So just loosen up the soil a little bit, and then so they should pull out very easily from the dirt. And then I'll show you here how I move them. Just get a big bunch of them. Now remember, you're not trying to get them really big right now. You're literally just trying to grow your own tomato plant or uh, onion plants to put out in the spring. Because we don't know how much longer we're going to actually even be able to buy plants, right? If, if they're ever going to be available. Um, so I already had my little trench dug. I just turned around, kind of put them in the hoop house there. And don't worry about spreading them out and having them perfect or whatever. They're literally just going to kind of sit there almost dormant all winter long until you're ready to put them out in the spring. You, you can see I'm not being very careful with them. And then just cover them up with some soil. You know, keep them watered until winter comes and you don't need to water anymore, but... So that's just another method for doing onions. Okay, so potatoes. Probably in about a month or so, a month and a half, you're going to want to get your potatoes out and put them in a sunny place so they can start growing their little eye, their sprouts. Okay? Um, you can do organic onion or onions. I'm on onions still. Potatoes, and um, those work. You can order them through Azure and different places like that. Try to have at least two eyes per potato if you can. That helps. There's so many different methods of planting them. I can't go into them. You guys can look on YouTube and figure out what works for you for planting potatoes. But when you dig them up, just let them sit in the sun. Don't clean them off. Like, hose them off. I mean, you can knock off big clods of dirt. But let them sit out for a day or so and then put them in cold storage. All right, so sweet potato slips. You can look up or talk to me afterwards on how to grow your own if you'd like to do that. But you can grow sweet potatoes or yams grown the same way in the north as long as you have protection. So they need to be in a greenhouse. They take about five months to grow, and they grow, you know, deep this way. So your soil needs to be really light and airy soil. And I will tell you this, too. Those vines go crazy. They will take over your entire greenhouse. You will be clipping them off all the time. Then you just give them to your animals. You can eat the vines. They are edible. So if you wanted to do a house plant, you can grow it in your same sunny window if you have space. <laughs> and you can eat the vines. So that's kind of nice. All right, squash. S they taste like spinach. Yeah, they're very tasty, very nutritious for you. 
All right, so I finally figured out how to grow squash. How many of you have been frustrated at August or September? You have a squash about that big. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's the trick, okay? Get your free black lumber wrap out. Get your bed warmed up. And I do this in the fall. I, I leave the black plastic on the bed. You can see the bottom left picture. That's the squash bed. It just always is the squash bed, okay? I just leave it there. I got a hole there where my plant is going to go. And in the fall, I'm filling that hole, the hole with um, like manure or kitchen scraps, stuff that can decompose all winter long, okay? And then in the spring, it's all ready for your plant to go in there, all right? So what you do, you start with a larger pot with these because squash does not like to be messed with. Their roots are very fragile, and if you go digging around in there, you're going to kill your plant. So start with a larger pot. Put your two or three seeds because they're not all going to come up, okay? Um, and if all three of them do come up, wait till they show their true leaves and then cut the other ones off. Just you only want one, okay? You want one plant in here. So what you do then is you got your hole all prepared. Maybe put some fertilizer down in the bottom of your hole and gently cradle the plant between your fingers and just tap it very gently. Okay, you've got the plant here, and then just very gently you're going to put it in that hole like this and then cover it up, just gently, okay? And it works. I've been doing this for many years, and it works. So then um, that's where I had the wall of water. That's the, the little mini greenhouse that's over top of the squash. I reached down inside that wall of water, and I just put that squash in there. So that has given it extra time and warmth because they like it warm. That's why you've got the black plastic. If you could grow these in a greenhouse, they would love it. But most of us don't have that much space. They take up a lot of space. Well, you can see the one there, the top left picture. That's a volunteer that just came up out of nowhere in the greenhouse, and I didn't want to waste it, so I trained it to go up. <laughs> But anyway, so then as soon as you get the plant in the ground, then cover them up again with your frost blanket to keep them warm because they don't have any flowers or anything on them yet. They don't need to be germinate or uh, uh, what am I thinking of? Thank you, pollinated yet. And you want to keep them warm. You're covering them up. Keep those blankets. And by the way, you can water through these. These are water permeable, okay? You don't need to move them. Keep them covered up until they start flowering, maybe sometime in June. Then take the covers off. You're not going to have frost anymore. They need to be pollinated. Then, in about the middle of August, your season is about up. Go out there and clip off all the little teeny tiny little baby squashes that you see all over the place, and it's going to break your heart. Because <laughs> it's hard to grow, right? And then you're thinking, I'm getting rid of all this food. It's not going to amount to anything. You don't have enough time for a squash that big to get this big in two weeks. So clip off every single little teeny tiny little squash that's left. In fact, you can take off the flowers even if you want to, the old flowers and stuff, new flowers that are coming up, because that just takes more energy from the plant, okay? So then the energy will go into the squashes that are left on the vine, and then cover them again. After you clip off everything, cover them again, because they don't need to be pollinating. Nothing needs to be pollinating at this time. You just want the squash that's left to get big. And I take a little bit of extra time on plants like this and cabbage because this stuff grows well here, if you know how to do it, and it lasts all winter. So I'm trying to get you thinking of growing food that you can keep in a cold storage so that you can feed your family all winter long, okay? So if you think about it, you're going to have carrots, you're going to have celery, you're going to have onions this in your greenhouse. You're going to have potatoes stored up. You can have cabbage stored up. Now you can have squash stored up. Your green beans grow really well. You can can them or freeze them. So if you start thinking, that's a lot of food that you don't have to buy anymore, okay? Okay, a few more things here. About done with part one. Blueberries, if you're going to do it, do it yesterday, okay? Because they take seven years. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you that. Um, carrots, we've already been over. Beets and turnips keep well. Celery, I already talked about. Corn. Do your corn the exact same way that you do your green beans. Do them in flats early, and then transplant them out when they're about six inches tall. And do the shortest 
day possible. Fisher's earliest, I think, is one. You can ask me later. Um, but yeah, find one that's like 60 days or 65 days. I've done it, and, and it works, and it's very good. Wow, it's, it's effort, though. Um, and then with your greens, try to get three crops if you can. Now, by the way, everything that I've talked about so far, you're only planting once. You can't do succession planting of tomatoes and peppers and onion. You can't do it. It's a once and done. That's it. Okay? You got one shot at it. <laughs> so, but with your greens, you can. So with greens, I'm talking like chard and lettuce and spinach and things like that. Do some research and find out what crop or which lettuce does the best in spring. Which one does the best in summer? Because they're not going to last. One lettuce plant is not going to last you all summer long because it will bolt. It will go to seed and it'll be nasty. And then which one you can grow in the fall. So then you're going to do s three different plantings of your greens so that you've got continuous lettuce supply. Okay? And if you've never heard of Jerusalem artichokes, they're also known as sunchokes. You need to get a hold of some of those and grow them. They grow like a sunflower looking thing on the top. And the big bulb on the bottom is like a potato or a turnip. And they spread. And you can leave them in the ground and harvest them whenever you want them. And nobody knows you have food over there because it just looks like a flower bed. So get a hold of those if you can. And raspberries and strawberries, they come back too. So make sure that you're doing those. Okay, real quick on the seed saving. Um, there's a really good book you can look up, Seed to Seed, by Suzanne Ashworth. Um, she goes through every single type of plant, how to save the seed, if you're interested in that. Um, basically, some of them you, you harvest the seeds in the summer and some in the fall. It, if there's a particular plant you want to know about, you can come and ask me. Um, there's two different methods. The wet method, wet seeded, means that you have to dig it out like a pumpkin, you know and then dry them, okay? And then these are tomato seeds where you have to actually let it rot and then peel the mold off the top and then dry the seeds because <laughs> it separates the cells, the sac from the seed. And then the dry seeded is just like lettuces and things. They get pretty flowers on the top. And I have a neighbor that just lets the seeds just drop wherever and they just come up at each year and he just has whatever wherever and he loves it that way. I'm not like that, but that's great. <laughs> Works for him. So, and then you can collect the seeds in paper bags and things like that. Just make sure that you are labeling your seeds. You will forget what these seeds are. <laughs> and then you'll have a surprise. Okay, and then, what if you run out of, uh, or if you don't have a garden? These are just a couple of ideas. I think that's a shoe rack that somebody hung up on a wall somewhere for lettuce. Grow bags and uh, some juice containers there. So those are just some ideas. Now, we will, I will take questions for this part, 101, while I um, get part two set up. And we're just going to keep on going here. Um, how tall of a fence? It kind of depends on where you, um, your location. Like if you're surrounded by trees and stuff, you know, the deer probably can't really just go running through there and, and, and leap, so it might not have to be as tall, but if you're out in the middle of a field, you probably need to go taller, at least six. Yeah. And you can, do, you can do two fences. I've heard of some people, they'll go out about a foot and a half from the tall one, and they'll do a shorter fence out here, like two feet tall, and they won't jump both of them because they're afraid of getting stuck between the two. Somet it's something like that. I have a six foot solid wooden fence around my backyard. The deer can't see over it, so they don't jump it. Yeah, she said a six foot tall fence, and the deer can't see over it, so they don't jump it. Yep. Have you considered planting those large oaks that are beyond the hedge and just growing them right there? Um, I haven't um, thought about selling it. I, when I first started, I used to print it and hand it out as handouts, but it was just too much. Yeah, but and then I was changing it all the time. If, if this is online, oh, okay. this whole program is on YouTube. Oh. I have, if you get one of my business cards, it's on there. Yeah, you can watch it and pause it as many times as you want to. Yeah, the whole thing is on there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go, yes. It kind of touches on like the predator thing, you know, of a plant. And I know like birds, they have a really tough shell. Are they doing the same, like after the fruit? Yes, the birds are after the fruit. 
you know, birds, you can get a cat. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's... She's asking if the birds affect anything else, but it's the berries. Now, by the way, if you have um, birds that like to eat the fruit off of your fruit trees, what you do is you hang hummingbird feeders in the fruit trees. Hummingbirds are like little soldiers. They protect that tree and their domain. I've sat there and watched it. They will chase off every bird that comes around and tries to eat the fruit off that tree. Yeah, keep the hummingbird feeders full. And then another trick that I've used that has worked pretty well, I saw this online too, get little flat rocks and paint them red with little green on it. It looks like a strawberry. Make it try to look like a strawberry. And then take those and put them in your strawberry bed just as your berries are starting to ripen, just before they're red, and the birds will come and they think that those are the berries and they'll peck at them. And then they get annoyed because they can't eat them. And then they won't come back. Okay, she's asking about the rodents, and I always get that question too, like gophers and stuff you're talking about. Um, cat. Our cat has done such a good job. He's chased most of them off. The ones that he couldn't get, we got by different methods. And <laughs> you can talk to me about that later too. And... Um, they're territorial, so usually once you get them, they won't come back. And in about eight years, I've had one. So I don't have a problem with them anymore. But you have to be vigilant. Uh, Co-op sells those little metal traps, so make sure that you're digging into their holes, their tunnels as far back, because they're sneaky. They do separate tunnels and blockades and stuff. So make sure you're actually getting in there. Stick your arm in there and make sure that you're all in the tunnel. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so let's go into part two here. So I um, was kind of getting sad at the end of the season, and I wanted to have more gardening season. I didn't want to just hang up my hoe and be done. And plus, I wanted to be able to feed my family year-round. And I thought putting up a greenhouse or buying a greenhouse has to be really expensive. It doesn't. So the greenhouse, it started me on this journey here, and I was Googling, I don't know, winter gardening in the north or something, and I came up with Elliot Coleman, okay, and I got all of his books and did all the research. So everything that you're seeing here is eight years' worth of research and how we've done it and our photos, um, things that worked, didn't work, um, and his motto is unheated, uninsulated, unbelievable, and it really is. That, that is the truth. It, it, this really is a miracle. I honestly didn't think it was going to work. <laughs> Although I saw his pictures and I thought, well, okay, we'll try it. And it really is a miracle. And so that's why I'm teaching people how to do this. Because most people don't realize that you can do this year-round. You can have food 365 days a year, fresh food. No heat, okay? The first greenhouse we built here um, eight years ago, I think, or seven, it cost us $500, and now it's about a thousand, but still, okay, that's that's pretty cheap when you start looking at greenhouse kits online, mm -hmm. twenty thousand, twenty-five thousand, okay. So for around a thousand dollars, you can have food year-round. And if you're just starting out, make sure when you're building your greenhouse that you put the longest-facing side south. You want as much sunlight as you can possibly get in the winter, okay? Yeah, sunlight in the winter. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> okay, so three things that you have to know to do successful winter gardening. Number one, grow the right things. Don't try to grow watermelons and tomatoes. It will not work, okay? Number two, you need to remember that everything you're growing takes three times as long for it to mature as it would normally because there's no heat, obviously, from the sun, you know, the, the, the summer sun, and it's cold. So keep that in mind. So if you're going to grow turnips, and they say 50 days, multiply that by three, that's 150 days until you can eat a turnip in the wintertime. So if you want to eat these in January, count backwards 150 days, and that's when you put them in the ground. 
<laughs> it's approximately July, I'll show you. And then the next thing you need to know is that you need to have good greenhouse plastic. Don't go buy the cheap stuff. Actually go to greenhouse supplier and get six mil, okay, it's on there, six mil greenhouse film. And if you can, try to get the kind that has the coating, anti-drip coating. Um, I believe, I'm pretty sure, somebody just emailed me about this. Johnny's has the plastic, and I'm pretty sure that their plastic already has the anti-drip coating on it, because that's what I've been using. Um, if you don't have that coating on it, you're going to be sorry, because it's a great green, it's a rainforest. Every time you walk in there, you're soaking wet. And then the last thing you need, we'll go over this again, is this cover right here. I'll show you that again. All right, so this is the first year. This is everything that I grew the very first year because I read it in his book and I thought, I'm going to do it too. So <laughs> I had so much food, it wasn't even funny. And the dates in parentheses, that's my actual math as to I went back every package of seed times three, did the math, and went back and figured out when do I plant it and when's the cutoff. So... I don't have time to do that anymore, so I just start in July and I end at the end of September. <laughs> that's how I do my winter garden. But all this stuff that's up here is all stuff that I've grown and I know that grows here and I know that it works well. In fact, the white spear onions, I don't know if they sell them anymore, but those, if you just let them go to seed, you will have onions in your greenhouse for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'm telling you, and they're good. They're the green salad onions, so you can move them around too, wherever you want to. And there, I have a few seeds, I think, maybe back there. <laughs> so this is what succession planting looks like. You don't want to put in your entire winter garden all at one time because everything's ready at once. So I do it about every two weeks, one or two rows of each variety. I start in the middle to late July, and I end around the beginning of October now. I don't go into October too much. It depends on your zone. Um, because you want your plants to get to a good size before the cold weather comes, okay? So what I'm going to do now is going to go through all, and remember, this is all online. You can watch this again, but here's how we made ours, okay? So we started out with a 12 by 20, little tiny walkways, just because I wanted more growing space than, you know, walking space. And like I said, I literally just went out into the woods and just took a wheelbarrow and just got dirt and made beds because that's what I could do. So it wasn't fancy, that's how I did it. Um, and I wanted to get it going in July, so that's what I did. And then we started building when we had time. So as you can see, the plants are already growing, we had to build around them, but that's just how it works sometimes. So then we put the wooden base around. This isn't fancy, okay? Um, I'm, th I'm thinking they were 10 inch. I think they were two by 10s. Um, and then, so this is the secret to the snow load, okay? You actually put rebar inside of the conduit. Do not use white PVC. <laughs> it will bust and break, okay? Get the gray conduit. They, you stick two 10-foot pieces together, which gives you a 20-foot span. And then you buy one piece of 20-foot uh, rebar, and you put that in the, in the middle of those. And then you bend them so they look like that. So then you just attach the hoops on the inside of the frame with some little clip, conduit clips, I think they're called. So one person just holds it inside the frame, and the next person grabs the other end and pulls it down, and it bends really easily because it's 20 feet long. Your biggest problem is going to be trying to find somebody with a long trailer to get that to your house, the 20-foot pieces of rebar. <laughs> okay, so that's how you do that. And then we put a support across the top there, and there's no rebar in that top the top piece. And then that gives you a six foot ceiling, okay? It's not real tall. Um, one way of remedying that is to have a taller base that you're hooking it to, you know, make that taller or dig down your walkway a little bit so you're stepping down into your greenhouse. That'll give you some more head space. Yeah. Um, and then this is how we did the front door, what it looks like there. And wherever the, the wood was coming into contact with plastic, we would use these old rubber tire tubes, and we would just tie it with that so that there wasn't any, you know, abrasive action going on there. So this is what it looked like when it was done. 
Um, the braces that go across the center of it there are not needed. We took those out. We thought we would need them, but we didn't, like for the snow load. And that just actually made more um, shadow on the plants. So we took those out. So you've got your plastic, and we covered both ends first, the smaller ends. We clipped them at the top. You can see those black clips, and I'll show you another picture of those. But we clipped them with the black clips, pulled it down tight, and then used little wooden furring strips with finishing nails in there, and then cut the door out last. So this is how we attach the plastic. This is just water pipe cut into sections, okay? You can buy the clips, plastic clips. You can buy them online, too. I think they're kind of expensive, but we just had this laying around, so we use this, and this works really well. Um, you just, you know, open it up like that, clip it down. It takes two people because one person has to hold this and the other person opens this and clips it on. Now, if you're going to have a lot of snow um, coming one night, you might want to get some of those really heavy-duty clips or clamps from Harbor Freight and put those over top of these because these can come popping off sometimes in the snow and then you lose them. So that's just another tip that's worked for us. And that's how we finished one end of it. It's called a half moon vent where it's just on door hinges. So actually the whole entire thing would open up so that you can get a lot of airflow in there. Okay, a lot of ventilation. Okay, then we went front to back there with it and we used a pipe and to roll it up and down. The little framing brackets actually just keep that white pipe from falling on the ground because if you don't put something there, your plastic will roll or not the plastic, but the pipe will roll and your plastic will fall off. So let me show you what we've did, what we have done since then, because you live and learn, right? <laughs> so we have since put in some of that bird netting on the front south facing side because the cat liked to get in there and dig up the carrots. So I put that there. Um, and then I added an automatic vent and um, those are really nice. Just look up online, automatic greenhouse vent. It, the little black, so bottom picture on the right, that little black tube is filled with wax, and it heats up during the day, opens your vent, your window, and then cools down at night and closes your window again. So you don't have to be a slave to opening and closing your windows. It is wonderful. Best thing ever invented. Um, we also added the beam across the top there all the way just for my peace of mind. We went, I can't remember if it was two or three years without that, and the snow would, you know, I mean, it held up, but you know, there were times where I'd go uh, like that, and I would go, oh boy. <laughs> um, but it held up, but that was nice because now I could tie plants to it. I've got uh, little pipes coming out of that too, so I can tie plants out here. And it just gives me peace at night. I don't have to worry about it coming down. <laughs> and then we put up a rest uh, retaining wall in the back there because we get a lot of snow that just drops off that hillside right behind it, and a lot of pressure on that plastic. So that's what we did there. And then in the front, we replaced the PVC pipe with that metal pipe, and it's got an elbow piece there with a hole drilled in it. And so that that pipe actually goes in and out like this so that you can control. You go up as high as you want, put the pipe in, and then it stops. Okay, so the pipe is the controlling factor of where, how high you can do your plastic. And I ventilate it almost every day all summer long. Um, probably around August if you wanted to, you can actually unroll it the whole way over if you wanted to and just expose the entire thing to the sun. That's what's nice about the plastic hoop houses. You're more flexible in how much you can ventilate it. Um, some people ask me about the glass or the corrugated plastic and all of that. You can use those. It's just harder to, um, to keep the heat down. Because I have friends that put up one of those with the, the corrugated plastic panels, and the, the roof doesn't open at all. All they have is a, um, a window at one end and then their front door. And they have two fans running in there all the time, and it gets to about 120 almost every day in there. And their plants don't like it. It doesn't do well. So if you are going to do a greenhouse like that, make sure that you get one that has the top that opens at least a couple and that you're running fans. You can see we just that's just an old truck fan that we hooked up to a solar panel. And so the solar panel, it just runs when the sun is shining on it, which is perfect. So that's pollinating, and it's also keeping airflow. You want to make sure that you're opening a door, rolling up a side, 
uh, having some something going, so there's airflow every day in there because if it gets hot, you're going to get, a, not aphids, spider mites. And those things are almost impossible to get rid of once you get them. Um, we also added string to it. Um, I screwed in little eyelet screws about every three or four feet on both side, long sides. And then we took the string back and forth, back and forth like shoelaces. And what that does is it holds your plastic in place so that when you're rolling it up and down, your plastic stays against the frame and it's not flopping around all over the place. And then if you have a big wind that comes, oh, somebody asked me that. We had a wind and it took the whole entire greenhouse and blew it over into the other field. So if you do have windy area, what you do is you take a T-post and you nail or uh, hammer that down into the ground and then screw your frame to the T-post, okay? And then you shouldn't have that problem. And the string will hold the plastic on. Okay, now back to the winter now. So you need to have your uh, plants covered with the plastic by approximately oct sometime in October, just kind of depends on the temperatures, but keep an eye on the temperatures outside. Once they start freezing, then you can put your plastic over your greenhouse. Now by adding that one plastic layer, you have moved your plants a zone and a half south. So they were in a five, now they think they're in a six and a half just from that one piece of plastic. Now, since you don't have to have that covered until um, October, that gives you a long time to go ahead and get your uh, greenhouse or get your plants planted. Do you see why I started so early? I knew we wouldn't have time to get that done, but um, go ahead and get them going. If you don't even have time to get your greenhouse built yet, get them started in July. And then just remember, you need to have it covered and completely finished by October. So it gives you some time. Now in November, this is the best part. You don't need to water anymore. The water tables in there are so high, you do not need to water. This is what's so nice about the winter gardening. You're not doing any work. You are not doing any maintenance. You're just going up there and eating food. It's fantastic. Okay, so now I will show you the next secret to growing here in this winter, winter garden. You need to make something that's called a wicket, and basically it's just number nine wire in this shape right here, okay? And this is what's going to hold your frost blanket. So what you do is you make it the width of the bed, wherever your winter bed is going to be, okay? And then your legs need to be 12 inches above the top of the soil. So if this is the soil level and your plant is here, you need about 12 inches between the top and here. And then you need enough down here to stick in the ground. And put them about every two or three feet so that your covers aren't drooping too much, and I'll show you that in a minute. And another um, hint, put those in the ground before it freezes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's the next secret. This is the AG19 fabric, okay, or frost blanket. You can get these online. I don't know, I think they're around $20 or something. And this right here would cover, you can see the picture on the right. This covers an entire 12 by 24 greenhouse, two beds. And it'll last you for years and years and years. As long as you're careful with it and you're not trying to, you know, rip it off when it's frozen. Um, so I get questioned, I'll leave this up here if anybody wants to come take a picture of it. By the way, this is 0 0.55 ounces. The insect barrier that you would put over, say, cabbage plants, is 0 0.45, okay, ounces. It lets in more light, and it's not frost. This is frost, so that's the difference. So people always ask me, why not use a heavier um, frost blanket? Well, so I did some research. So lightweight versus heavyweight fabric. It only adds two degrees warmer, but it cuts out 50% of the light, which leads to more soil freezing. So you want to use this one. Just use the AG19, okay? So now that you've added that, and you're going to add this around probably November, yeah, November, your plants now are underneath this blanket, and now they think they're in another zone and a half south. So now they think they're in a zone eight. So just by adding the plastic and then this right here, you've gone from a zone five to a zone eight. Isn't that incredible? Who would have thought? <laughs> 
these are just some temperatures that I took. And then another hint for you is to remember um, when you're going to go up and harvest your food, do it in the middle of the day when everything is thawed out because they will actually freeze. Your, te your covers will freeze, soil will freeze, plants can freeze, okay? And trust me, I've gone up there early in the morning trying to get a salad for lunch, right? It doesn't work because these are frozen solid. And if you try peeling them, they will tear. I mean, these, they do tear. See, they tear very easily. <laughs> So wait until it warms up and things thaw out in there. And then what I usually do is I get everything I need for the week. Just put it in the refrigerator. And if you know that very cold uh, temperatures are coming, like I'm talking minus below zero temperatures, go up there and put an extra cover. Either put another one of these, or if you don't have these, I just use sheets. Just get a bunch of old used sheets and keep a pile of them up there so that they're ready. Like we had minus 20, right, a few weeks ago for a long time, and then we had some other, wow, that was crazy. And by the way, I will say that my celery did not like that at all. And it was, um, I had transplanted it too close to the outer wall to the plastic. It did not make it. Now, in previous years, I had put it in the center of the greenhouse, and it did fine. So another word of wisdom to you. Um, so, yeah, if you know that cold, cold temperatures are coming, Double cover everything up there, and then when the temperatures, or if it warms up even during the day, go ahead and peel that off so that it can be ventilating because they can mold very quickly without any type of airflow. So as soon as those cold temperatures are gone, take that extra cover off. And your plants will probably sustain some damage. You'll probably be going and clipping off some dead leaves here and there. But overall, your plants should be fine. They, they'll come back. Most important thing to know about the winter gardening is your plants need the light, okay? It's not heat, it's the light. So you need to make sure, even if the sun is not shining like today, okay, they're still, this is a day like the, the pictures there, it was 38 outside and it was 52 inside, so under the cover it was probably 62. And it's not even sunny, but there's still light. So make sure that you are removing snow. It's good exercise. Go inside and beat the top with a broom. <laughs> Sweep it like this or take a squeegee outside and pull the snow down. Just don't let it, um, you know, get pile up beside your greenhouse because if you've got a pile of snow this big and your plants are way down here and your sun angle is like this, it's not going to get, your plants aren't going to get any light. So if you have a snow blower, that's great. Go around the whole thing and blow the snow away from the sides. So this is from Elliot's book. I just thought it was interesting to put that on there so you can see. He actually took um, temperature readings under the fabric. I haven't done that, but I thought that was kind of cool. 70 degrees. No wonder they do so well, right? So these are some questions that people have had. Why don't you sow any seeds after October? Because it's just too slow germination. It takes... Um, th th you, ha you need to wait until the longer days return, like in the spring. Um, they won't get big enough to really amount to anything in the wintertime to make it worth your time. Um, and even if, um, let's say you sowed something in mid-October and it maybe came up and is like two or three inches tall, because I've tried this too, okay? Then come springtime, um, you're waiting and your plant is going to start growing in the springtime but you know what it's going to do right away? It's going to go to seed. It's going to flower because it is a winter plant. It doesn't like it warm. It likes it cold. So don't try that. I've tried it. Okay. Um, and then I get this question, too, about two layers of plastic. If you do two layers of plastic, you have double the cost and then you also have less light coming in, and then you also have to run a fan to keep those two layers separate. Okay? Um, so Elliot doesn't do that. He says it's not necessary. I'm not going to do it either. It, I've been doing it with one. It works for me. Um, and also cuts down the amount of light. I think I said that. And then people ask me too, why not build wooden cold frames inside your greenhouse? Why do you do all of these, you know, wickets and all of this? Well, it's cheaper for one thing. It takes up less space. If you try putting a bunch of wood 
inside there, imagine how much space that takes up. Not only that, but then you've got a cover, like a, if you're using glass cover, you need to go in there every day and prop it open to vent it, prop it to vent, okay? These are ventilating. Your plants can breathe through these. They cannot breathe through glass. Okay. If you can't do that, and maybe you only have a small space or a smaller budget, here's an idea. I will say, these are all over YouTube, by the way. Um, my neighbor did one of these, and she said that it came down on her. So what she did the next year was she got a 4x4 four four or 6x6 six six post, I don't remember, and put it up in the middle, and that held it up. So once you know that the snow is coming, go ahead and just put some 2x4, I don't think it's big enough. Just put a post up in the middle of it to hold it up. Okay, anybody can do that. A little kid could nail together those two by fours at the bottom. You know, anybody could take that and bend it. Here's just some more ideas again with the glass. Just make sure that you're ventilating and keeping the snow off so it can get light. And then I get the question, do you only use your greenhouse just simply for winter growing? I did the first year because I didn't know any other way. So now I'm going to show you how I go month to month and how I use the entire greenhouse all year. So we're going to start in January. So what I do now is I have one bed that's only for winter growing. It's the one that's facing the south, the longest one that's closest to the south where the sun would hit the most. Um, and that's just dedicated just for that. So the top right-hand picture, that's the center bed. That's where the carrots and the celery are. And those go in between the tomatoes. The tomatoes are out now, obviously. It's January. <laughs> And then the bed there at the, at the bottom right is on the other end. Again, it's in the center, and this is where my um, peppers go. And so what I do in August, when the peppers are uh, probably about done as far as more coming on, then I spread out the, or, uh, the lettuce seeds under those, and that's what I eat from all winter. So we kind of already went over this in the first part, but what do you start? What seeds do you start in January? So this is what's going on in January. You already have that. In February, these are just some plants that are growing in there just to give you a sample. There's a lot more than that, but this is just some of them. And then in February, you're doing your eggplant, your peppers, and your tomatoes in the house, in your sunny window. And then... Right about now or in the next week or so, the covers come off inside because it's warming up and they need to be ventilating and um, they don't like it warm. In fact, if you're going to be, um, you, you need to keep an eye because if you go out there on a warm, sunny day, you'd be surprised at w how hot it's going to be in your greenhouse in January even. You walk in there, it could be 80 degrees and your plants don't like that. So... Throw the covers off like you see in the top right picture. Pull the covers back. Let them ventilate. Hang in your hammock for a couple of hours. Enjoy the warm sunshine. Pull some weeds if you want to, you know, <laughs> enjoy yourself. And then cover everything back up before you go to bed that night. <laughs> okay, and then March. That's when I'm done sowing seeds inside the house that will be transplanted. But that's the winter bed you can see there on the left-hand side. You can see the snow. See I'm ventilating it? It's rolled up about a foot or two. See the snow? <laughs> Isn't it amazing to walk in there and you've got, you know, plants that you can eat like that when you have all that snow outside? So this is what's going on in the house there. Peas, I've already got peas started. I, each year I kind of push the bar a little bit further. I try to say, oh, what can I start earlier this time, earlier this time? <laughs> Okay, and then I will start my zucchini and my squashes in the greenhouse, in those pots, about that size. Because I'm tired of stuff being in my house, and they don't need to be in there anymore. It's warm enough out there. So that's what's going on April and May there. I'm starting those seeds. And then you can kind of see the picture there at the top left is when we first started out. I didn't know what to do with that center yet, okay? Um, but that's the winter bed on the left. You can see things are starting to kind of be done there. Plants are hardening off on the right-hand side. That's April and May. Um, in May, you can see 
picture the bottom left corner, see the green beans in the flats? Those are coming up there, so that's what's going on in there. And see, that's still the winter bed, but I've already pulled stuff out because it's done. And I'm getting it out of the way because I'm putting tomatoes in now, I'm putting peppers in the ground, I'm sowing the uh, carrot seeds and things like that. And so you can see now how I'm using all the space in there, con continuously using space. Okay, and then after your frost, your danger of frost, you know, you can do your squashes and things outside, especially if you use those walla waters. And then in June, your winter stuff, I mean, it's done. It was done before, but if you're going to keep, a, keep seeds, what you need to do is just keep maybe one plant and tie it up to the hoop or something to get it out of the way and then just collect seeds from that one plant so that everything else is out of the way. Um, that way that gives your winter bed at least a month to rest. And then you can add more compost if you need to and get it ready because what's happening in July, you're going to start your winter sowing. So that's kind of what it looks like in June there. You're moving some things out, like your green beans and your corn, saving seeds, June and July. And then this is July. So what I used to do was I took that, that whole bed and I just divided it up, say, if, you're if, you're, if you have, um, if you're going to do July, August, and September, let's say you're going to do three months' worth of plantings for, for um, winter. Take the amount of space that you have and divide it up and decide, if I'm going to do six plantings, then I'm going to divide this by six, which means each section's only going to be, what, two feet long or whatever. It just depends on your size, but you're trying to do succession planting. So what I used to do was I would do all of my um, spinach here, and then I'd go down three feet, and then I'd do all of my chard here, and then three more feet and do my kale or whatever. Um, and that's fine. I mean, that works all right to do that. But this is what I do now. I actually do a variety. And the problem with doing that is when you go up to harvest, you have to take the covers off that entire bed, the whole row, to get a little bit of spinach, a little bit of chard, and a little bit of kale. So now you can see the bottom right picture on the right there. I do everything all in one section, that whole variety of whatever it is that we like. So I don't remember what they are. Two rows of spinach, two rows of mizuna, two rows of onions, two rows of kale, all of it within the same four or five foot section. And then two weeks later, I go down here and I do a repeat. I do the exact same thing again. So that way, when you're going up there and you're harvesting in the wintertime, you just have to move the cover up off that little section right there. It's all right there. And next time, you'll go over here and you'll just get from this section. Does that make sense? That has worked better for me. Okay? In August, just another sample of what's growing, and then you will do two more plantings. Just doing about every two weeks, okay? And then, like I mentioned before, this is when you will take your lettuce seeds and sprinkle them underneath your pepper plants that are already growing there um, to give them a head start for winter. You don't need to transplant those. Just throw some seeds around. Um, you can move them if you want to later. <laughs> and then when your, um, when your pepper plants are done, don't rip them out of the ground and throw, okay, because you're going to pull up all of your lettuce seeds, that you, your lettuce plants. Just cut them off at the ground level and just let them decompose. All right, in September, two more plantings. Just another sample here of what's going. And by the way, the Tokyo Bacana, I do like that one because it's very versatile. If you don't grow anything else, that would be probably my number one besides spinach because you can use it fresh like a salad and you can stir fry it. So I like, I like plants that you can do double, triple jobs. Okay, <laughs> that's Tokyo Bacana. All right, and then what is going on in October? You might be moving some things in, like your um, celery and your onions. You're moving those things in. That's just another sample also of what's going on in there. And then November, remember you don't need to water. I only, I watered one time this year and I couldn't figure out why. I went up there and everything was so dried out. And I said, what is going on in here? And then I remember I forgot to unplug the fan. 
So it was running up there all the time, drying everything out. December, I just thought that was a neat picture because it just shows the variety of things that you can grow and the colors. And It's a pretty good salad, huh? <laughs> so just think of how independent you can be just by putting in a little bit of effort here. Okay. Okay, November we went through. December we went through. Okay, and this is a question that I get a lot. Are they actually growing or are they staying alive? <laughs> so I went back and looked at dates of these pictures, and it's the same six month period of time, the coldest part from the winter, from October to March. <coughs> same beds, same camera angle view, okay? Same years. So are they growing? They are. Slowly, but they are growing. And, you know, if you, if you get a, a bunch of minus 20 degree nights, you're going to have a little bit more struggle. Um, but they will come back. Just trim off the dead stuff, okay? You'll see little green things coming up in the middle and leave that alone. Um, and by the way, when you go to harvest, well, make sure... Uh, read the description of your lettuces and things, because some of them are cut and come again, meaning they will come back. Some of them are cut once and they're done. Some of them, you can only harvest the outer leaves. And if you take the center leaves, they won't keep regrowing. So keep that in mind. Make sure you know what kind you're growing. Okay, so let's have questions about this part before we start the last part. Yes. He had, so he's asking about the details of building the greenhouse. Um, I can tell you which book would be best to get. He has like three or four of them. No, not for building. I don't remember the name offhand, but I can find it for you. Okay. Uh -uh. Just this PowerPoint. Okay, any other questions on the winter gardening part? Yes. Okay, she's asking, if you know it's going to be cold, could you put a light? You could if you wanted to. Um, one time I did an experiment, and I ran one of those buddy heaters in there to try to get my tomatoes and peppers to last for maybe another week or so, and it wasn't worth my time and my effort to do that. But, I mean, you could run a light. Some people will run, or they'll burn wood. They put wood stoves in their hoop houses and do that. But the thing is, is that it's not about the heat. It's not about the heat when you're winter gardening. It's, it's the light. So, yes. She's asking about the types of grow lights. And I really, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you'd have to do some research on that. I'm not sure about that because I've never done the research. But if anybody in here knows about grow lights, you do? Uh, okay, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> I rigged up a couple of full spectrum lights in light fixtures that I found at the yard sale. Yeah. I hung them underneath the cabinet in my second bathroom and used just miscellaneous pots. I grew lettuce all, all winter long, enough to have two salads a day. That's great. That's cool. The light was all I needed. There's a lot of things you can do for sure. Um, why don't we just stand up and stretch for about a minute, and then we got about 30 minutes and we're done. Oh. <laughs> I feel like I got a classroom full of kids that are getting antsy. <laughs> You can, you can. It depends on what you're doing. I mean, you can start. Or um, which plant are you talking about in particular? Oh yeah, yeah. I do that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, and then transplant them outside. Okay. Yeah. So you would have to transplant them outside. I would, because lettuce likes it cold. And once it's too hot, it goes to flower and goes to seed, and then you've lost it. Okay. Spinach, too. Okay. Can you do most of your gardening in your greenhouse, like if you have the ability to take in the... I wouldn't do green beans in there. Okay. They take up too much space. Oh, got it. Okay. I wouldn't do potatoes in there or corn. I need to put a chart on there, inside, outside. Right. <laughs> yeah. Does that help? Okay. Yeah. So that's called the winter harvest. Yeah. Okay. So I should have him talk to you about how he does the onions. Okay. Can we buy onions for the little bit of what you call the roots that are left? And you go up about a third of the way of the onion and cut that off and then put that in some hydroponics. Okay. And we don't even tease that. We got goat manure and everything. Yeah. Else. Yeah. And they start growing onions and then we have them. Cool. That's cool. Okay, I'm ready to start if everybody can take their seats. Sorry, I'm yelling in this mic. So I'm over at the other place. Okay, there's room in here. That's okay. Okay. I was wondering about ground temperature. You still have to go There are charts online that you can look at. I don't have one. But different plants are different temperatures, and you can buy those thermometers that you can stick in the ground. I've never used them, but you can. We're going to start our last. Yep. We're going to start our last section here, so that everybody can get out and get going home. He's going to use it. Yeah. Okay. So let me start by saying. Um, I brought a special guest with me, first of all, his name is Brent Wagner, and surprise, he's all the way from Bonners Ferry, and he is a certified herbalist, and he knows a lot more about plants than I do. So him and I have been teaming up together. He's been going with me to all my classes and helping me with this section, um, and we've been doing, we've been having fun, haven't we? <laughs> but let me just give you a real quick background how this all started. So I wrote this little tiny book. Some of you have probably seen it around Ace and different places like that. Um, and I made it small so you could carry it with you all the time, right? And you know what you can eat when you're out backpacking because I didn't want a book that was like 10 pounds, you know, for Florida or whatever. So that's how I started this. And then I added um, the medicinal properties of each plant because I thought, well, why not know how to heal a burn or how to heal a cut? And so that led me to all this research. So that's how this came about. And then... I started talking to uh, Brent's wife, Sherry, about how can we work together. And so we came up with this idea of putting together these um, small herbal kits. And so he's got kits up here. I've got components to put into a kit. And so what I did was, can you hold this up? And it's going to fall apart, but just kind of hold it like this. You can see a picture. I got this little kit off Amazon, and so what I did was I started foraging around and finding um, plants and things to put in here um, so that I could have my own herbal kit together. And I've got some stuff of his in there, too. Um, so we've been working together on that. And then what I did was I came up with all these little um, labels of what the names of the plants are and then how to use each one and the dosage of it. So I took these and I put them on these little tiny bottles of, you know, my little tinctures and different things like that, so I had them with me all the time. So this is kind of evolving into this really neat project. And so I told him, I go, instead of me just coming up here and telling you, here's a plant that you can eat, why don't we go a little deeper into it? And so I'm excited to have him here. He has a lot of knowledge to share. So you, gotta, you have to put this on like that on the back of your head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now wire free, finally. <laughs> and then just put that in your, po your shirt pocket or your 
We connected? Yeah. Yeah? All right. Last week I was using this for the mic. <laughs> and she says it doesn't work that way. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. My PowerPoint. Yes. Um, we, we made a kit. We had like a, we called it Doctor in a Box. It was a big kit. It had all kinds of components in it. And it was almost $200. We didn't sell one. Well, maybe one or two. You know, we had to bribe them. <laughs> but, but most people have a lot of things that are in these herbal kits. You know, you, you have the bandages and the scissors and things like that. So we've gotten a lot smaller. And, and we're trying to give ideas. Um, my wife put this together with bandages and things and antiseptic spray and and we can talk about these things as we go through this but it's kind of a personal thing because it's it's a momental it's a huge task to try to put something together that covers everything but you want to go specific and you may have herbs that you like and we'll go on kinnikinick or bearberry, or uva ursi, depending on what you call it. This is great, and it's if you go outside and there's a place on a rock cropping or something that the sun has kind of melted away the snow, there's uva ursi. It grows low to the ground, the green, the, the, the leaves are just fine, and that's what you would take. You would take the leaves, and usually you would take them in the, I think you could take them at any time, but usually... In the fall time, you would take them and dry them, and then you would have that. You could use it as a tea. It's excellent for urinary tract infections. It's excellent for burns, uh, for scurvy. That's lots of vitamin C in it, kidney infection. So it's a winner, and you can eat it raw or cooked, the berries, that is. The berries are kind of pithy, but nonetheless, survival food, right? It's not a gourmet. All right. Burdock. How many have gotten your dog back from a walk? And it's full of the burrs. All right. Well, it happens. But burdock, uh, gobo is the name of it in Japan, and they eat the roots. It's a delicacy. They, they enjoy it. And so the roots are very helpful. It's a good blood purifier. It also helps to, clear, to uh, clean your liver as well. If you ever touch the stem, the uh, stem on it, and then you lick your lips or you touch your finger to your lips, you will experience something that you will never forget. <laughs> it's, it's bitter. It's very bitter. But nonetheless, it does its job. Um, what can you use it for? Yeah, it's a poultice for poison ivy or oak. And it uh, works in so many good, yeah, hemorrhoids, canker sores, swellings. Can eat it, good food. Chamomile. Have you ever been, had a sinus congestion when your nose is closed up? Well, one thing that helps, you could do chamomile. Drink some nice chamomile tea. It'll help open up your sinuses. It would also help to soothe your nerves and calm you down. Very helpful. Um, great for hemorrhoids, eczema, sunburn, yeah, colic, cramps, laxative, it works well. And remember, there's a lot of herbs that you could mix, and you get beneficial results from both of them. Like we just saw that uh, dandelion was good to mix with those. So it works well. The red clover, you can really use any color. The yellow is extremely high in your... Uh, blood thinning qualities, but uh, red clover is great. It's a great blood purifier, and um, I like it. You know, uh, if you have acne or if you have eruptions on your face or somewhere on your body, you can drink the tea, and you will see your skin clear up. So it's a great cleanser, and it's good for us. It's a great blood cleanser. We need it. Uh, you can make a tea out of the flour and uh, enjoy it. 
Yes. Please. Nice. Okay, great. Also, a lot of houses don't have copper plumbing anymore. We're going to the PEX or the PVC or the old iron, but most of those are cleaned out already. Um, so there is, there's getting to be a copper deficiency in our country. All right? This has copper. And it's a great way to get supplemental copper into your diet. Yeah, it's a winner. It's, it's a great tasting tea, and it's a win-win situation. Okay, comfrey. Comfrey, is, does anybody not know about comfrey? Okay, you've got a treat today. Comfrey saved my marriage. Let me explain. If you've probably heard me tell this, you probably, I've heard this story before. But what happened was my wife was sitting so pretty across this big expanse, big gorge. She was sitting on a log, had a pretty smile. And she was just expecting the best from me. And I thought, I'm going to wow her off her feet. I'm going to swing over. And I'm going to jump down behind her, take her in my arms and do a double dip, give her a big kiss, and she's going to go, wow, this guy is awesome. So I did. I started my journey. And I got about halfway and I thought, uh oh, I better start moving around so I can land behind her. And she was sitting there like that. And uh, I knew it hurt because my knee hurt. <laughs> I, I hit her cheekbone with my knee so hard. She was like, oh. And my daughter was going, Dad, <laughs> you know, that was bad. Anyway, I said, let me see it, let me see it. And she pulled her hands down, and she had this huge purple noogie already. I'm like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> anyway, so I got her home, and I ran, and there was a comfrey patch. And I got a bunch of comfrey, and I smashed it and bruised it, ground it up the best I could, and we made a big old mound on her face. And then we wrapped her like a mummy to hold it in place. And she actually let me sleep with her that night in bed. It was, it was amazing. <laughs> But in the morning when we woke up, I said, let's, let's see what it looks like. You know, there was no purple noogie. The bump was all the way down. And she says, it doesn't hurt. I mean, if you push hard, yeah. But it doesn't hurt. So it removed the bruising. And so comfrey is a great healer. They use it for uh, broken bones. Um, if you know Dr. Uh, Christopher, he makes a BFC, which is bone, flesh, and cartilage. It has a lot of comfrey in it. It's very good at healing bone, flesh, and cartilage tissue. And I can't uh, talk good about it enough. I cut my hand wide open one time, sharpening a file. And when I see blood, I turn to mush. When it's my blood, that is. And uh, so anyway, we, a, a lady put some comfrey salve on this. And from that searing pain to, wow, like three seconds, it took that searing pain away and it healed very quickly. So I can't recommend, Comfrey is a wonderful healer. It should be used, and you should have some planted at your house. If you get the kind that's not the, the Russian stuff, it spreads. But you can get the kind that um, the seeds are sterile, so it only, it only spreads by the root cuttings. So it's not so bad. You can control that. But I recommend it. Uh, please get it. It'll help you. And I didn't even go over the whole list. I'm sorry, but it was so good for many things. Okay, echinacea. Wow, stimulate your immune system. Very good to stimulate the immune system. Very good if you get a, a poisonous spider bite or a uh, rattlesnake bite. We don't have any rattlesnakes here, do we? They're, they're, in, they're a little, little more Montana. But anyway, anything poisonous bites like a hobo spider, all right, or a brown recluse, you want to take lots of echinacea internally. Maybe the whole bottle. It won't kill you. And then you want to take tincture, take the whole bottle. If it's dry herb, take the whole bottle. Get that inside of you, and that will stop that breakdown of skin tissue. 
And then also you can also use it to put on as a plaster on that area. I would also use plantain. Plantain draws very well. But this is wonderful. It's, it's a blood purifier. So many good things. Good I stuff. Yes. Yes. But only after it's kind of cured down. Well, well, that is because you want that root to grow as much as you can. And if you harvest it before that, yeah. So you can take the seeds out and you can chew those seeds and you'll get kind of a, have you ever, a tingling like, like you stick your tongue on a nine volt battery? <laughs> you know how it's similar. It's similar to that. Okay, but the seeds have that, that, that in it, and it really, it just, it's going to help you, help your immune system go. All right, pushing on here. I always take too long up here. That's the problem. I'm trying to go. Um, Elderberry. She, that young lady back there, Autumn, she has some awesome elderberry juice, elderberry syrup, and I don't know if she has anything else elderberry back there. But elderberry is one of the best things to use if you feel a cold coming on. You know, you start to feel uh, a little pain or a little sinus issues, and you know, you know when something's getting a hold of you, right? Usually most of us have been around long enough. We say, uh-oh. That's when you want to take it. Because what it does, it stops the, um, what can I say, the growth or the expansion of the virus. It will keep it from replicating. And so that and ginger juice. If you would go out and get a pound of ginger root, cut it up and make a tea out of it, and drink that like for three days, it will do the same thing. But this tastes so nice too. So elderberry juice is really good. My neighbor says, my kids never get sick. He says, we make a big batch of elderberry jelly out of it, and my kids never get sick. So... Yeah, and maybe there's some fluctuation with that, but for all, elderberry is great. This is kind of the light blue. If you go up to high country, like Roman nose, or you don't know what Roman nose is, but that's up by us. But anyway, if you go up real high, where you can you can get up there in like August, that's when these black elderberries, the uh, Sambucus nigra, that's when it is coming ready to harvest. And they're both good. They both work. Some people get sick from this. It makes them upset, their tummy upset. Even the blue ones, um, better out than in, right? So it's okay. It's a, if, if you have a problem, maybe don't eat it, but definitely stay away from the white and the red. You don't want to mess with the white and red elderberries, but the light blue and dark blue is good medicine. You can use the flowers as well. The flowers make a real nice tea for children. And it doesn't make you have that vomit episode that some people might have. Okay, plantain. I love plantain. If you have a, a small child and, you know, they get into the yellow jacket nests, it just happens. We went for a walk at Eden Valley and all these kids were walking with us on a nice afternoon walk and they got into a yellow jacket nest. And we had about 15 kids with their mouths wide open singing chorus, right? And uh, so I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? Okay. So there's all these little tiny plantains growing along the gravel road. So we were, my wife and I were picking them all and we were giving them to the parents. Here, chew it up, chew it up, chew it up, chew it up. And they put it on your kid's sting. And then about a minute after they did that, it was silence, was, was golden, yes. So it draws toxins out or uh, any stings, anything like that. It works great. Uh, poison ivy can help with. Um, if you have, jewelweed is great for that. We don't have jewelweed usually that grows here. But I went to my parents' house in Indiana. I got a whole bunch of it and made up a oil salve part of it anyway. Still got three left. Anyway, but it's great for those type of poisons. Um, also, blood poisoning. If you happen to get a, a something in your hand or whatever and you notice a streak coming up, well, just get plantain. Mash it up, 
put it on that spot and put it over the area and plantain will take out that infection. Also, of course, charcoal will do the same. Charcoal is very good at absorbing those. But this is a great thing for out in nature. It's a winner. And you can also use it. It's good. It makes a nice tea for, uh, well, diarrhea, but also for your congestion, for your sinuses. So plantain's a winner. And of course, you've heard of plantago major, probably. That's a picture of plantago major. There's also a plantago cilium, and that's where they get cilium from. You know, metamucil, the bulking agent that helps you go be regular or whatever. If you do use that, just use lots of water with it, or it'll turn into a concrete brick, and you'll be sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, St. John's wort. I know a lot of the um, people don't like this that work at the, uh, ah, what's the word for them? The agriculture people. It's on a list for noxious. But I love it. I love this stuff. Are you ever depressed? It's a great thing to take as a tea or as the green leaves. Very good for depression. Helps lift your spirits, especially at this time of uh, the season. It's good to have some on hand to help lift the spirits. Um, you can make an oil. And if you ever, for burns or for cutting your nerves, if you know somebody gets in a tragic accident, like their hand in a blender or... Yeah, I know, it sounds bad, but this has happened and it's like you cut, it, you cut a lot of the feelings so your nerves are cut and there's no feeling, what do you do? You want to use this oil. So you go out and you pick a bunch of the flowers and it's going to be late June or early July here. All these flowers will come out. Just pick them and start filling up your quart jars. Fill up a quart jar, maybe press it in there nice and tight and then you want to fill it with olive oil. Get a good olive oil and uh, let it sit for, well, in two weeks, it'll be starting to turn red. It's the hypericums from that yellow flower that are very healing. And it, it is like a nerve growth factor. I mean, it, it, it makes nerves grow back very quickly if they get severed. So you'll be impressed if you use it. It's a great healing herb and it's great for oil. But you could also make a tea with the greenery. Or you can just cut the whole tops of the plant off the flowers and the greens and use those together. And it's a nice round, roundabout herb to be used. And you can feed your chickens. Yeah. Oh, by the way, is this the next one? This is. Look, guys, we're coming into a time of trouble, I believe, such as never was. And we need to know how to use these things. This plant here, if you have animals, what are you going to feed them when you can't get hay? You can make wonderful hay out of nettles. If you know where they grow, cut them. Every, every couple weeks, cut them and save that. It'll keep growing all summer. And you can keep cutting and keep cutting. You can, this is a great food for you to save, especially for this time of uh, winter and spring. Use this before all the greens start coming up. This is full of minerals. It's full of many good things your body needs. This is survival food. So enjoy nettles. You can also, if you let them go to seed, you can press the seeds for oil. And you can burn your little lamps for oil by this seed. Um, you know, when you boil it, or when you dry it, or when you cook it, it takes the stinging effect away. It won't sting you anymore. Um, so anyway, uh, you can use it for your hair, for your scalp, UTI, um, for your lungs. Yeah, so many things. It's a great plant, and uh, great for allergies as well. So make the most of it. Wild lettuce. I know we don't have any drug users in here, but wild lettuce, <laughs> wild, <laughs> wild lettuce has a, has a minute, and it's a low power um, opium in it. Yeah, people will go out and they'll get all the milk out of it, 
and it'll help them with pain. But what you can do, it takes a lot of work. So what I encourage you to do, just go out and take the plant, cut it, dry it, usually dry it upside down, and then cut it up, chop it up into lots of small pieces. Uh, put it in your wife's Vitamix. Woo! Works really good. Don't do the roots, though. I've destroyed one blender. Um, she's still married to me. But, but anyway, grind it up. Fill your quart jar about, th- about a quarter full of the tops of this plant. And then pour boiling water over it. And after it steeps and you can drink it, drink it. And you will lose all your frustration. <laughs> you will say, yo, life just got better. And that pain will go away. And you'll likely just want to fall asleep. And you will wake up with no hangovers. And it works very well. It is bitter, though, so it's hard to get addicted to it. Yes? Yeah, most, most parking lots that haven't been taken care of for a while <laughs> will have this one growing. <laughs> the stiggy nettle, it's, it's usually in a lower, at a wet place or a, a more damp place that hasn't been disturbed. And when you do disturb, it'll keep growing. Fence rows, yeah, they're pretty easy to find. But, and yes, you can buy the herbs and... Uh, I'm, I'm failing. I am trying to get the seed for a lot of these that I think are really important. I just haven't got it yet. I'm working on it, though. I'm working on it. Oh, by the way. Sorry. Um, yeah, great for milk flow for mamas that need a little lactation help. Um, yeah, whooping cough. Great thing. Okay. Um, yarrow, you've probably seen yarrow growing, and uh, it, it'll even, it's still above the snow in places. It, it's, a, it's the last one to fall down. But uh, you can eat the young leaves cooked or raw, no problem. It has a unique taste. <coughs> um, I can't describe it. It's not bad. It's just medicinal. Um, Toothache, you can mix it with service berry for your toothache. You can mix it with cayenne, equal parts. Um, it's very good. Muscle pain, stops bleeding, helps ulcers, promotes sweating. We used it in the Lifestyle Center. We gave a lot of uh, treatments, fever baths for people dealing with cancer. We're ra- ramping up their immune system. And so you would give them yarrow tea and it would just it would open up their pores and cause them to a lot of per, per, per sweating, and uh, it just helped in the treatment to raise their temperature. So we used it for that. Um, and it makes a great ointment as well. Okay, other plants. Cayenne pepper should be in your first aid kit. Cayenne pepper is very good to stop bleeding. Um, if you cut yourself, you can dump powder in that cut and after you do your little jig <laughs> it will stop the bleeding very quickly 10 seconds maybe so or you could take it internally and it'll also be very helpful to stop the bleeding and also helps with internal bleeding and yet though it stops bleeding if you get a heart attack and you have a blockage or if you have a stroke and you have a blockage if you take that, it will help get blood to that area. So I can't say enough about uh, cayenne. It, it is just a winner. Now, there's people like Dr. Schultz that will recommend hot. You get the hotter, the better. And there are a lot of people, if they like can, they, cayenne, they say the same thing. Oh, you got to have the hot. Well, you do what you can do. I'll, I'll say that much. I won't tell you the story. But anyway, um, yeah, grocery store stuff is like 40 or under, Schofield heating units. Um, you could go with 130 or 100. That'll cook your goose. And if you're absolutely not, you can go with the scorpion, the ghost pepper, or the Carolina reaper. Whew. 
and you'll be having the screamers when you the next day, you know. <laughs> but anyway, cayenne is wonderful. So we have it in our kit. We we did it in the. That's that's the other one. But anyway, we did it in the glycerin. So it's a it's a glycerin. It's not so hard. It's kind of like candy, uh, cayenne candy, and uh, we also do lobelia. Yeah. All right, the next is hawthorn. I can't say enough about hawthorn berry. If you have heart issues, if you have arrhythmia, or if you have possibility of a heart attack, hawthorn is such a great thing to have and be using preventively. Not that it'll keep you from having a heart attack, but if you would have a heart attack, it's going to protect your heart from damage. It's like going to bulletproof your heart. So... It's just going to work so better. Uh, my wife uses it when her heart acts up, and it, it just works really good. You can make a hawthorn berry syrup very easy, or you can make a tincture or a glycerite with it. works very good. Um, lobelia. Lobelia should be in your first aid kit too. If you know people that have asthma, or you see someone that's having an asthma attack and it totally shuts everything off, I lost a friend that way, a dear friend. And uh, I wish I knew what I knew, and I wish I was close to him. I would have given him this stuff, but I didn't know. But uh, lobelia, and it's got to be lobelia inflata. It's a nice, pretty blue flower. I know they sell lobelias at garden centers, but it's got to be inflata. It is a relaxant, a spasmodic, antispasmodic. So in the lungs and the bronchi are in spasm and <gasps> can't breathe, put it under the tongue. It's going to start opening up. The lungs are going to open up. They're going to be able to get air in there. I have friends that use it for their asthma. They're taking puffers. And they, if not, can go off their puffers. They can greatly reduce the puffs that they take just by supplementing with lobelia. Do know that lobelia is an emetic. So if you take too much at once, you'll puke, puke your toenails up. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. But anyway, not so much, you'll be fine. Um, Oregon grape. Oregon grape is poor man's golden seal. Golden seal is known because of its berberine content. It is excellent for mucous membranes, for your eyes, for your stomach, anywhere where there's a mucosa barrier or a mucosa, golden seal or the berberine is very healing to that. It's a tonic to it. So this is poor man's golden seal, and it grows out here. I know you could go out and find it right now. It's, you pull up the roots, and if you skin the roots a little bit, it'll be yellow. That's the berberine content. So just take the roots, wash them nice, Throw them in your wife's blender. It doesn't take much to grind them up. And uh, then you've got some nice berberine that you can use for those type of problems. Um, yeah, it's good for staph infections. So many good things. Okay. Oh, you can eat the berries too. If you want to see what berberine tastes like when the, when the Oregon grape is ready, I mean the grapes are on it, just pluck some and eat them. My wife will go out there and just dine on them. Uh, she likes it. So, But that's berberine. Very good. All right. Pine. Look, pine grows all around us, and I recommend you to use it. If you know anybody that suffers with COVID or suffered with COVID or maybe anything that's going to be like that in the future, Go out and get some pine needle tea. I recommend that good old ponderosa, those long ones, big old trees. Sometimes it's hard to get those green ones if they're real big. But somebody asked me, what kind of pine should I use? Well, typically I say the one that grows closest to your kitchen. But he was worried that some of them may be uh, dangerous but I've never experienced anything that was dangerous. He believed that white pine was the best, so I'd just throw that out to you. Um, but I've never had any trouble, and I use the 
uh, lodgepole pine that I have close to my house. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Yes. Thank you. It's a good testimony. So, yeah, God has given us so many good things out in nature to use. Um, raspberry, look, if you are a young lady or you're a mother of a young lady or a grandmother of a young lady that is entering puberty years and everything, Man, have them drink the raspberry tea. Life will just go better for the whole family. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just everybody is happier. It just works better. Um, I haven't located it yet. Yeah. I'm s- yeah, leaves. And, and, of course, you want to just get these things when you can get them and dry them and dry them in a, air conti- an air, a container that air can't get to, an airtight container, and keep them in the dark. Works very good. And she's coming up here like she's trying to get me off the stage. Um, yeah, that's the last one. So I have a sign-up. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. I was going to get to that. By the way, if you're interested, if you're interested in uh, learning to hone up your skills on salve making and tincture making, I would like to have a class up here. It's $30 per family, and you'll leave with a tincture and a salve, and you'll get the experience of making and, and watching it being done and, and participating and there's a sign up there, and if we get enough people, then we will we'll have that for sure. And I want to say, um, I believe we're very close to the end times. I believe that we don't have long. So I want to encourage you not to, um, what do you call when you don't do something? Procrastinate. procrastinate. Don't procrastinate on your garden. Don't procrastinate on learning herbs that can help you and, and get out of debt. Stay out of debt if you can because you don't want to be a slave and that's what you're going to be when this digital money comes through. May God bless you guys. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that everybody got the flyers. If you haven't, there's some there. The big, this is the plant walk. If you went last year, you know what this is. We're doing it again. We're expecting maybe a thousand people. So, (laughs) you'll. (laughs) So anyway, thank you all for coming.